Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is uh, Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners, going to help us hopefully make sense of this uh, market environment, talk to us about some groups that are at uh, key points to pay, uh, pay attention to. Today, we have further distribution going into the close, similar to what we saw yesterday. So the question, again, ongoing question has been, are we at the end of a bear market rally rolling over, or are we continuing to build momentum to the upside? We're going to look at the charts together today, see what questions we can answer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show, The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to break down the, uh, the day's price action, look at the charts within the short-term context, but connect it most importantly to the long-term. And we've had this issue the last couple days where we've, uh, we've been uh, seeing distribution into the close, right? In that last 30 minutes, uh, 60 minutes or so, usually represents uh, ETF uh, rebalancing, ETF adjustments, um, flows, and also institutions making trades. So certainly feeling more distributive going into the close for the last couple of days. Uh, you know, but at the same time, you have technology as the one S&P sector, it looks like, that's finishing in the positive today. So continuing to see a, uh, a move toward the defensive uh, nature of, of sort of that big cap, mega cap uh, tech trade, uh, so we'll have to look at some of those charts together. Today, we're going to deep dive into the communication services sector, which I think is a really interesting one, finished toward the top of the list today, but with quite a diverse uh, group of companies within there. Having said that, we've got a great guest today, uh, Jonathan Krinsky. We've got some other fantastic guests coming up on this show and elsewhere on Stock Charts TV that I wanted to point out to you. Uh, tomorrow, we have Clint Cowles from TD Ameritrade joining us. Uh, next week, we have Roman Bogomaza, who's an expert in Wyckoff uh, analysis. And then on the 13th, we have Sam, Sam Stovall from CFRA Research. And then two other shows next week to be aware of. On Monday the 11th, our next episode of Behind the Charts features a conversation with Keith Fitzgerald. I did not know Keith. I knew of his work, but really enjoyed uh, getting to know him and have uh, enjoyed keeping in touch with him since we sat down with him at uh, the Money Show down in Orlando. He's a fellow uh, Seattle area resident, so, uh, so and a fantastic strategist uh, as well. And then on the 13th of next week, uh, next Wednesday, we have The Pitch, which is our, one of our newest shows featuring a roundtable conversation with three strategists giving you some of their picks, pitching you their ideas uh, for the coming week. So should be a really fun uh, conversation there. Let's get to our market recap. And, you know, when I'm looking at the S&P 500, the open question that I've posed to all of you watching the show is, uh, is sort of this bear market rally thesis. And, and as I mentioned recently, I feel like everyone's validated. If you feel like you are looking for an uptrend, you've gotten it with higher highs and higher lows. If you are long-term bearish and you consider this a bear market rally, you're feeling pretty validated as well because we've had a you know 50 to 61.8% retracement of the February to March sell-off. Uh, we're sort of right in that sweet spot of where a bear market rally should go to and where it should end. So I think we're right at that decision point. As we look at some of the charts today as a, in, our, uh, in our market recap, I think you're going to find we're right at that pivotal moment in, in, on a lot of charts. We had a lot of stocks face, facing resistance. Uh, with earnings, you have a lot of stocks face, facing some key binary outcomes going up or, or down very quickly based on the results. And I think what you've seen on the last two days is certainly, you know, from what I'm seeing, favoring sort of that mix of distribution where you see, uh, you know, distribution in the last 30 minutes of trading. So the last two days, you've certainly seen a weaker tape going into the close. The S&P today finishing down about 0.7% uh, to 2848. Um, you have mid caps and small caps leading the way down even further. So small caps down one and a quarter percent. Um, also, in terms of sector relationships, you have technology leading the way uh, higher. So tech actually up today. The, the S&P down 0.7%, tech, the XLK up 0.8%. Now, a lot of that is in the face of earnings. You have tech companies reporting earnings and how we're adjusting relative to that. But you also have flows into 
the relative safety of that big cap technology trade. And so the relative strength of the XOK is held up very nicely. You can see the NASDAQ 100 actually up 0.6% today. Um, so it, it certainly has been a tech doing fine and everything else kind of struggling. What concerns me uh, as, a, uh, as an overall market participant is this is what would happen if the market starts to really roll over. I think tech would be the last thing to roll over that, you know, relative strength of technology as we bring up a chart of the XLK, that's what will probably hold up really, really well uh, before the market rolls over um, <laughs> because people are going to sort of flow there. And then the very last thing you sell is, your, is, is the Apple and your Microsoft, those tech names that have done so well that are relatively stable blue chip uh, companies that have uh, stood the test of time now in recent years. Having said that, the relative strength of tech the chart of technology just looks positive, right? You have the XOK making new relative highs for the last year plus. You have a short-term uptrend of higher highs and higher lows. We just made a new closing high again today. Um, so again, it's hard to be negative looking at this one chart alone. The chart of the XOK looks pretty good. We talked about that being sort of a, a core position, thinking of that as, as, a, uh, as a central part of how, you're, how you could be thinking. And I think that still makes sense based on the relative performance that you're seeing there from technology. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500, though, and, and, and look at what today, how it fits into the bigger picture. We're, we're in sort of that range between the upper end of what I think is reasonable, uh, it, given a bear market rally. Um, and if we break above the 61.8% level around 29.35, if we break above the 200-day moving average, it's above 3,000. I think if you are bearish, you have to start to reconsider that because... We have now gotten past the last uh, sort of point of no return, and I think you could be aiming towards previous highs around 3,400, if not even, even further, right? If, if, the, if, this, if the market can get above that sort of hurdle, it's hard to imagine we're going to have dramatic uh, retest of the lows. However, if this is where we start to fail, if we break below 2,800, which would be below the low from the last week, break below 2,750, which would be the low from... Uh, week, two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks ago, that was that last swing low going, uh, going here in mid-April. If we start breaking below those levels, I think you can really start to seriously consider a revisit of a of more of a deeper bearish thesis, an idea of retesting or at least reapproaching those of those previous lows. And again, the fact that the RSI has topped out right around 60, it's pretty classic for a, a bear market phase. It's sort of lining up that way. So I think we're, we're at a really interesting point. And I think you have some key levels to watch. I think a break above 3,000, a break below 2,750, that's sort of that range that I'm paying attention to. One of those things is going to happen. We're not going to just be in this range forever. One of those things is going to happen. I think that will tell you a lot about the next, uh, the next period. You know, it's interesting. My guest yesterday, Samantha LaDuke, was talking about that seasonal tendencies, right? The, the, uh, the May to November, sell in May, go away uh, sort of thing. And I post to her, how do you think about those seasonal relationships at a time when it feels like everything's off the table or, or everything's on the table, I guess, right? That they're, we're in uncharted waters with all of these things. Uh, and, and, and to be honest with you, I think seasonal trends are interesting. I'm much more concerned with the price trends, right? Seasonal trends are interesting. Cycles are interesting. I think of them as part of the mosaic, but the main thing I'm going to look for is the uh, is the price. So, having said that, technology certainly being a a bright spot today. The Nasdaq 100, the XLK, both finishing in the positive. That shows you that there are bright spots in the equity universe. Again, what concerns me is that's where I think people would flock to looking for safety. What was down today, interestingly, is utilities, uh, which is one of the more defensive parts of the market. So it's not like people were flocking to defensives today. Uh, it was more on offense, right? With tech, communications, services, consumer discretionary, healthcare at the top, utilities, energy, real estate, all in the bottom uh, four. Financial is also uh, struggling as well. And again, it's almost a non-issue. I think we're focusing so much on some of these other sectors that are sort of these bellwethers. Financials have just been tough. And if you look at the relative strength of financials, we talked in our sector segment on Monday, super challenged, and I, and I don't see that changing anytime soon, unfortunately. In terms of other movements that we saw today, I think it's worth pointing out that the Chinese ETFs actually did very well today. So while the S&P finishes down, anything related to China was uh, positive today with the KBA, which is the A-shares uh, ETF, over 3% today. So certainly a market that has been challenged at time, uh, certainly feeling the love today being one of the, you know, some of the, the bright spots uh, overall. If you look at the industry groups and the top industry groups, and again, we use the Dow Industry uh, Universe, um, you know, there are a group of consumer discretionary, over half of, uh, or about half of the, uh, the industries in the top 10 are from consumer discretionary. So you see automobiles, specialty retail, footwear, broadline retail, 
toys all in the top 10 sector industry groups. You also see some of the technology sectors. This is why tech has done so well today. Semiconductors up 1% electronic equipment uh, as well. So you have some of those groups within consumer, within tech that actually did really well today. And that's what is pushing those to the top. On the downside, insurance companies really struggled today, down five to 6%. Um, uh, also within consumer discretionary furnishing, some of these like Leggett and Platt comes to mind. LEG was uh, one of the big losers today, down eight or 9%, if I remember right. Airlines also down uh, as well. So, you know, again, I, I would caution you, especially with this sort of adjustment period, we're in sort of transition period, digesting the, the big sell-off and now digesting the gain until now. The last couple of weeks have been really sort of a choppy sort of, uh, of, of making sense of things sort of uh, period. It's worth noting that even though airlines appear to be coming out of the, the gloom and doom, are right back making new uh, closing lows with our airline index going down below 100 for the first time in, uh, in quite a while. Uh, even undercutting the uh, the March lows there, so certainly uh, being more uh, more distributive with some of the um, uh, with airlines and also some of the REIT uh, groups. So some of these uh, groups had done uh, a little better, making you feel like uh, that people were really buying into the weaker parts of the uh, of the market. Today was not one of those. Today was more of a right sizing flock to technology and usually flocking away from most other uh, most other places. That's our market recap for today. A little later, we're going to get to some of the asset allocation uh, themes that have emerged. We need to take a quick commercial break. Back with my guest, Jonathan Krinsky. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks, as always, for joining us on the final bar. I want to remind you, we answer your questions as part of our final bar mail segment uh, a couple times a week, and our next one will be uh, later this week. Just shoot us an email, uh, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com or on Twitter. Uh, just uh, tag us in a comment at FinalBarSCTV, and we'd like to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. We have such a, uh, I, I think are so blessed to have some really knowledgeable analysts joining us on the show. And today is one of the, the best, uh, Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners. I expect it from the New York area, but, uh, but I hear weathering the, uh, the, uh, the environments in Minnesota, which is a hot bit of technical analysis, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I've been out here for a couple months, so uh, it's nice to, to get out of New York for a little while. Uh, unfortunately, it's for different reasons, but it is what it is. That's exactly right. So as we, as you might've heard, we're talking, uh, you know, before you joined us here, you know, just talking about this overall environment, right? We've had this, you know, the huge sell off into the March lows, this, you know, what I think a lot of people are considering a bear market rally right up into that 2950 level on the S and P. And then the last week or two has been sort of this digestion period, sort of this choppy period. What, what is your toolkit telling us about what we should expect uh, going forward here? Yeah. So also, <laughs> Appreciate you having me on the 10 year anniversary of the flash crash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> happy anniversary. Kind of, you're right. You're yeah, right. Happy, happy anniversary. So we'll get that out of the way. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of the points you brought up earlier um, are kind of how I'm thinking about things in the sense that uh, history would say that we're still at a point where it, it could still be a bear market rally. Um, you know, if we go back to the tech bubble, the NASDAQ 100 actually retraced about um, a little over 70% of the initial decline. Uh, so it, it peaked in March of 2000, uh, sold off, and then got back, you know, 70% or so before the September peak. Uh, and then obviously it, it went down from there. So on a time frame perspective, <clears throat> that was a little more drawn out. Um, but from a magnitude perspective, it was very similar to what we've seen now. Um, and I think given the velocity of the move down, and the rebound, it, obviously everything seems to be happening quicker now than in prior cycles, um, given, given the virus. So uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the big question now. Um, you know, I think under the surface, the fair argument is that a lot of the majority of, of stocks and sectors are not acting like um, maybe the S&P and certainly not like the NASDAQ 100 or the XLK like you spoke about. And we know why we know that the reason for that is is because the indices are cap weighted 
and mega cap tech is such a high high percentage. So, you know, if we look at something like the equal weight S and P relative to the cap weight S and P, the last five days, equal weight has actually had its biggest underperformance relative to the cap weight that we've seen um, since we have data back to 1990 on the equal weight index. So, there is some massive dispersion going on. Um, our sense still is that it resolves itself to the downside. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of when does that happen. And, um, you know, another thing that's really stood out to us since really January is the just absolute relentless outperformance of the NDX to the S&P. And mm-hmm. we've really never seen a market cycle where the NDX relative to the S&P has outperformed leading into the top throughout the bear market and on the way out. And that's what's happened. So it's almost... Uh, just in some ways, it's just something we've never seen in any of the other cycle. So with something like that, and I have a chart up now, the NDX relative to the S&P, does that concern you speaking to a narrow leadership of, you know, big cap tech leading things? Or is it more of a, the market can be fine like this for a while because it's it's been working and big tech can kind of lead the way further? So is that is that a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? Or is it just descriptive about the nature of, uh, of the market now with consolidation in some of those big tech names? Yeah, it, it, it would seem to be a negative or a cautionary sign to me. Um, you know, obviously, we, we can certainly always see the reverse play out where the average stock, the value stocks, the beaten down stocks, you know, kind of find their footing and rally and play catch up. And we saw that for uh, a very short period of time um, in April, we had one of the biggest uh, reversion trades where you, you've seen the low momentum stocks absolutely rip to the upside. And that was one of the biggest reversion trades we've seen um, in the last couple of decades, but that quickly reversed itself. So it's, it's more likely in our view that the, that the mega caps eventually succumb to the downside. Um, but, you know, certainly anything is possible. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. So you said two charts ahead of time. We just have a minute or so left, but I did want to get to your chart of biotech and then, uh, and then the uh, uh, gold miners. We'll start with the yeah, IBB so, biotech. What is this uh, telling you here? Yeah, so unlike the NASDAQ 100, which has been pretty much going one way for the last uh, 10 years, biotech we actually think is attractive because it went sideways uh, from 2015 right up until right before the virus happened. It was about to break out of a five-year base um, obviously got hit with everything, but the relative strength has actually accelerated. So we like the fact that it's been consolidating for you know five years and is showing relative strength. We think that's an area that should be leadership coming out, regardless of what the overall market does. Um, and then gold miners, GX, a similar thing, but we actually have a seven-year base for gold miners. Um, and I think they get a lot of uh, pushback for gold and GDX, but the reality is it's actually been outperforming the S&P. It's hitting multi-year relative highs to the S&P. So I think gold and gold miners, um, there's certainly a spot for them, especially, um, you know, given what's what's going on on the macro side of things. And uh, we like, you know, we like those long-term bases with relative strength. Two great charts. And it's interesting as you're, as you're showing those, it strikes me that uh, we have our scooter rankings, our stock charts, technical rating, a trend following uh, percentile based system. And the top two uh, groups represented are gold miners <laughs> and uh, biotech. So Newmont there Mining and Regeneron are, are two of the top names in, uh, in our list. So, uh, so I, I think your point is, uh, is well taken. Jonathan Krinsky, thank you so, so much for joining us. Hope you and the family stay safe and uh, look forward to having you in, uh, on again soon. All right. You as well, Dave. Thank you. All right, that was Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners joining us from uh, from the Minneapolis area here, but usually from uh, from New York. Really appreciate his take, and and I love you know as as Jonathan is talking, I'm looking at his charts. The last two ones, looking at the IBB and the GDX. What strikes me is the simplicity of looking at the bases, looking at the relative performance, and focusing on what is working, uh, because that I, I think in general, if you want to outperform a, a passive benchmark. You need to own things that are outperforming, and, uh, and, and he's highlighted two groups that certainly have been able to do so. So a, a great take there from Jonathan. Our next segment is a Sector Deep Dive. What we love to do occasionally is dig deeper into one particular sector, start to think about how it relates to uh, what you might have seen, uh, what you might have seen elsewhere, other, other themes, other charts we talk about, and, and, and really think about the construction of some of those sectors. So today we're going to dig into the communication services sector. So what I'm going to do is just look at a chart of it together. We'll talk about what the sector uh, is comprised of, what kind of companies are in this sector. We're gonna look at the different groups that make it up. And then we're gonna look at some of the charts together and, uh, and, and hopefully draw some, sco- some conclusions about 
where some of the opportunities might be. So communication services is one that you may be less familiar with because it's one of the newer sectors in the last, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years, I want to say, two new sectors have emerged. The real estate sector, which was spun off of the, old, of the financial sector and became its own. Uh, and then the other one was communication services. And what happened was they took the old telecom group, which was essentially AT&T and Verizon and a couple other names, and wrapped it in with some of the internet retail uh, stocks or, or internet communication stocks, things like Facebook, uh, Alphabet, and then also incorporated media names like Disney and others. So it took some from technology, took some of the media names and broadcasting names from consumer discretionary, combined that with the old telecom and created this new communication services uh, sector. What's interesting is the telecom sector used to be sort of a rounding error, and you pretty much could look at a chart of AT&T or Verizon and have a sense of what that meant, but it was only 2 to 3% of the S&P, if that. Um, now, communication services is one of the largest sectors up with technology, with consumer discretionary, um, and so it's something I think you have to be, uh, be aware of. In terms of what's happened here, um, you know, communication services on a relative basis, in, in a lot of ways, has sort of been the market. Um, was uh, essentially uh, sideways, pretty choppy with the market through much, much of 2019. So if you look at a chart of communication services, you look at a chart of the S&P, they're not far off from one another. That sort of uh, fluctuated a little bit as things have recovered and, and underperformed, outperformed during these bull and bear phases a little differently. So uh, communication services actually was doing okay and started to accelerate right around uh, that week leading up to the the, the bottom on uh, on stocks, that third week in March, you saw the relative strength spike up. But as things started to accelerate out, it kind of came back and, and came back to a normal uh, sort of range, continued to be sort of a market performer. In the last week or two, it started to uh, to emerge and started to accelerate on relative strength basis. And that's why I thought it was kind of interesting to talk about. We've talked about many of the sectors um, uh, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, utilities that are sort of testing their 200-day moving averages. Some of those like utilities, consumer staples have failed at their 200-day now making new swing lows. Something like consumer discretionary is still sort of testing it. We'll have to see how that evolves. Uh, the XLC, the communication services uh, ETF, is in a similar sort of situation where it's right at that sort of point of no return, testing the 200-day moving average from below. And the question uh, that remains is, is it able to accomplish this feat? Is it able to overtake the 200 day and I would argue have good momentum to uh, to retest the previous highs? Or is that the sort of A, B, is this the B wave or a two wave before the next leg down as, it, as, we, as we see this return of a bear market phase? The relative strength is telling you that it's holding up pretty well and a lot of that is driven by some of those big names like Facebook and others that have, that have, uh, that have held up really well. So what is the uh, communication services sector actually uh, what is it made up of? Now, to answer that question, you want to use the industry summary page. The way you get there is click on charts and tools on your on the website and go to industry summary on the right. You're going to get this page. I usually use the uh, the table view just because I can sort things very quickly. Um, and I'm going to sort it on the scooter rankings. This is using the stock charts technical rating uh, to put them in order of essentially relative performance. So internet has been the uh, the number one group. If you click on that, you're going to get a list of stocks that comprise that uh, group, and you'll see very quickly why this as a, an industry group has done very well. Um, stocks represented here are things like Netflix, um, Facebook. Uh, these are ones that I mentioned, sort of that, um, sort of that uh, big cap. You think of it as the big cap tech trade, but it's really in this other, uh, in this other sector. Uh, Alphabet down here as well. So you've got some mega cap names that are represented. You also have the video game stocks like Activision and Electronic Arts, which have done very well. If you look at some of these individual charts, you can see why this uh, group scores so well. Facebook might be a really good example of that. We'll look at uh, Electronic Arts next. Um, so this is a stock that is retesting its previous highs. Certainly, in, in it's, re, it's gotten back up to that range. New relative highs for the last year. Facebook, you know, again, if you didn't know that the world was ending in terms of the equity universe and this whole bear market rally theme, it seems like stocks are actually doing really well if you look at this, uh, look at this one chart. Electronic Arts, Activision actually... Uh, already making new highs, accomplishing new highs, overtaking their uh, January or February highs already. And Activision uh, gapped up again today, up another 6% with a new relative high for the last year. So those are some of the charts that, uh, that comprise that first uh, group, the internet group. Those are names, when you think of communication services, that's probably where you're going. 
You also have to remember it's things like uh, broadcasting names. And the challenge when you get into these names is you're getting into some of the stocks that have been hit uh, a little more hard. So D Disney is in this group, Discovery, Fox. Um, and these are charts that have not looked as attractive. So again, these actually look more like financial stocks. We're going to look at JP Morgan, I think, is one of the three and three. It looks a lot like 21st Century Fox. These are stocks that sold off, had a nice little sort of reaction rally, but really got maybe a third of the way back up and now breaking down to new swing loads. The relative strength has been uh, relatively abysmal. Here's Disney. Uh, again, not horrible, but definitely not one of the better uh, stocks with Disney. You're sort of testing support around 100, which is a key round number to pay attention to. But the relative strength, it's not just been the last couple weeks that that's been uh, relatively challenged and not just since the market low. That actually relative strength turned over uh, in December, actually before the new year, yeah, the relative strength starting to uh, suffer as a lot of stocks accelerated into their January or February highs. And this group actually struggled a little bit. So there are a lot of uh, stocks within that broadcasting entertainment group that have been more challenged. And the last one I will point out to you is Fixed Line Telecom. And this is the group where you get uh, AT&T, Verizon, sort of the Ma Bell uh, stocks. And again, these are difficult charts only because they rallied very nicely not nearly as quickly as some of the other places. You can see the relative strength was still pretty negative for Verizon, even with this rally, even including the dividends. But now you see things breaking to new swing lows. So you have Verizon going to a new one month low. Now, uh, if we look at AT&T, which is the next chart, again, breaking down through its most recent swing low, the relative strength uh, has been weak. The RSI didn't even get near to, uh, to the 60 level. It didn't even break above its 50 day moving average here. So within one sector, you actually have the haves and the have-nots and everything in between. You have the high-flying mega cap trade of Alphabet, Facebook, Netflix. You have uh, stocks making new relative lows, things like AT&T and Verizon, the fixed line telecoms. You also have uh, media names that are struggling like Disney, Discovery, Fox, and, and others. So it's worth digging a little deeper. We didn't get into like publishing and some of the other groups that are represented, but I think it's a really interesting sector to break down because you have a, a quite a diverse uh, group of companies. Uh, when you look at something like energy and materials, they tend to be relatively homogenous, right? Most of the stocks tend to trade in a similar way because they're tri tied to some sort of macro theme or macro, uh, like a commodity or something. Uh, the, this group, th this sector, communication services, actually provides a good amount of diversity. So I think there are opportunities within there if you look around there. And, and again, what concerns me, what I would be looking for is whether or not the beaten down groups like AT&T and Verizon start to recover or whether the high flying Facebook alphabet Netflixes start to roll over and, uh, and, dis and agree more with some of the beaten down parts of the sector. I think wa watching communication services could give you a good read on the overall environment. Well, we need to wrap up with the three and three. Here we go, three charts in three minutes. Chart number one, the long bond ETF. Bonds have sold off and the, the TLT is making a new swing low. I think this is pretty important. It's actually testing its 50 day moving average from above for the first time since that really spiky period during the, uh, the, the market sell off in uh, February to March. It's the first time it's back to its 50 day in, uh, in quite a while. I think if it's able to hold this, you see the next uh, leg higher and, and bonds actually hold up pretty well as stocks potentially would sell off. Having said that, it's a key point. And if you're able to hold that low or not, I think we'll tell you about maybe that next leg uh, in bonds. People assume it, it being a good safe haven if stocks sell off, but look at the chart and make sure that that's the case. Having said that, chart number two is gold. Jonathan Krinsky was talking about the GDX, which I agree. I think it's a long-term base that works. And I think gold, the chart of gold overall has been very, very good. You can see the relative strength on the GLD has been relatively challenged for the last six weeks, though, as stocks have held up very nicely, especially the mega cap trade, while gold has actually been more of a choppy period. So this is what I call sort of a pennant pattern, which is a, a big run up than this sort of short term, higher lows, lower highs. We'll have to see which way this resolves. Does the GLD resolve down below the lower end of the lower trend line or the upper trend line? I think that's going to be really key. I wouldn't be surprised if it resolves higher based on what I'm seeing. And then the final chart, we talked about communication services, talk about the dominance of mega cap technology. On the other side of the coin, we have something like JP Morgan. I mentioned some of those communication services stocks look more like a bank. And this is why, if you look, the J JPM has actually broken down through trend line support, failed at a declining 50 day. The RSI didn't even get near 60, testing a new relative low uh, for the last year. And I think seeing that follow through just tells you there's some inherent weakness underneath this mega cap strength that's holding up the S&P 500. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our show. Thanks to our guest. Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest uh, Partners joining us today. 
For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.